the cloud. Thank you. Go ahead, John and Jessa. Sorry about that. Hi, hey, thanks so much for having us. Um, I'm Jessa David, and I'm the Media and Communications Specialist for the Recycling and Solid Waste Division. And um, if you have any follow-up questions, you can get in touch with me, and I'll put um, my email in the chat there. So if you have anything following our Q&A after the presentation. John? Uh, sure, I'm John Febo. I'm the general manager for the city's recycling and solid waste division, and I'll be giving the presentation. I also want to pass it over to Margaret. Uh, she's the city staff person who's also on the call to introduce herself. Hi, everybody. I'm Margaret Kashuba. I'm also in recycling solid waste, working on implementing the new food waste recycling program for our residents in the city and uh, meeting the 1383 requirements. So good to see you all here. All right, I guess I'll get right into the PowerPoint presentation. So um, I'm here to brief you a lot about Senate Bill 1383, uh, also about the actual program we're implementing, implementing in response to that. And there is a sort of financial aspect to the presentation because it involves a rate adjustment that will be going to our city council in January. So um, we'll start with the first uh, slide here, a little bit background on the Senate bill. It's an unfunded state mandate requiring diversion of all organic material. Uh, households can long, no longer dispose of organic food waste as garbage. So cities must divert organics and green waste from landfills. Cities bear the cost of the implementation and ongoing compliance of the diversion programs. We are, our implementation of citywide food waste collection is anticipated for July, 2022. Um, some of the changes that ha have happened that are leading to this rate adjustment as a result of doing it are increases in our processing fee. So the city participated in a request for proposals process to get rid of the combined stream or get rid of or recycle the combined stream of green waste and food waste organics. And we did a joint project with County of Sacramento and City of Folsom. So on the left there, you can see our previous rate in 2020. Uh, 2020 and 2021, where we were um, uh, land applying our green waste. It is a, a approved recycling method uh, by Cal Recycle uh, under the diversion law. It's 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 a it's a beneficial use. Uh, is not as beneficial a use as composting. And when you add food waste into into green waste, you can no longer um, land app land apply it. So we were somewhat forced to go to the higher and better use we wanted to anyway. And so we go to the higher and better use in terms of all that green waste, 70,000 tons of green waste, plus add the food waste in it, which we'll talk about later. It's another 15,000 tons of material. So, uh, and you can see on the bottom, although it was competitively bid, our organics processing rates increased from $42 a ton in fiscal year 2020 and 2021 to between 73 and 104, dollars per ton in the fiscal year we're in now. And when we add food waste in um, July, it goes to these higher numbers here, these 98s and 97s and 104s. So um, that's the impact on the rate payers. Um, this is our tonnage. We expect to increase from around 70,000 tons to as much as 85,000 tons, with, we're forecasting roughly 15,000 tons of food, food waste when it fully builds out and everyone starts to participate. Possibly more, but we hope for more, but that's just sort of um, with a lot of the industry people kicking around uh, the, the idea of what you actually get in the end. So that's kind of the number we're using just for these estimates. So our processing expenses increase actually from 3.3 million a year, multiplying 70,000 by the you know, the 70, uh, you know, by the $40 a ton, $43 a ton to $6.9 million. When we add the organics and we add the new, uh, the food waste, we have more material and we're paying a lot more to get rid of it. So this green chart shows the processing fees in millions of dollars. So basically we're going from 3.3 to 9.8. So well over $5 million increase alone in just processing. So we're a $60 million enterprise fund, do the math. Right there, that's an eight to 9% increase in what you would have to pay monthly, you know, just to sustain our division right there. So we'll be showing a rate adjustment later. It's a little larger than that because it includes everything else. That's just processing. We've got containers to buy, uh, trucks to buy, all sorts of other capital equipment. 
So uh, this is a little bit more about uh, some of the things that happen. It's an item of interest and it does relate to the rate adjustment, but due to the stay at home order, our garbage and recycling and everything has gone up significantly. Um, almost 11% increase in garbage tonnage, 16% increase in household junk, which is our, our appointment-based programs. So everybody's calling in and cleaning out their garages. And then when the pandemic kept going, they clean out more, the attic or whatever. So. We saw these numbers go way up, uh, dump coupon usage, illegal dumping across the board. So it all further deteriorates our bottom line, basically, where um, we get the same amount of money in every month, um, but we have much more expensive costs of disposal fees and uh, vehicle miles traveled, all that work to, uh, to collect it all. So uh, we were told by city council to come back uh, before we come back with a rate adjustment and to implement as many efficiencies as we can. Uh, I thought these would be really uh, good to keep in the presentation for this group because well, in addition to efficiencies, there's a lot of environmental uh, benefit we're doing here. So first thing we did was we completed a reroute in our cities uh, in February of this year. So some of you who live in the city may have exp experienced a day change on your garbage going from four day, 10 hour to five day, eight hour work week. Uh, we completed yard waste organics agreements with three different vendors. Margaret was uh, spearheaded that whole project. We ended up with medium term capacity, five to 10 years of capacity uh, or five to 10 years of processing with these three different contractors. And while the processing fees are much higher that we showed it, there are less vehicle miles traveled because we're going to we have this uh, a facility now in the north area we deliver to. So trucks, for example, up by Hagen Oaks or Northgate area that used to go all the way south to Fruit Ridge Road now go to the Roseville Road transfer station. So some of those things that we did, even though we're paying more, uh, result in less VMTs. Uh, we are completing construction of our compressed natural gas station in January 2022. It's more efficient. We reduce our dependency on non-city stations. We even added underground infrastructure in place for future electric vehicle charging. We're, we're uh, in the process of uh, trying to purchase our first electric vehicle, uh, gar electric garbage truck. Um, we haven't purchased it yet. There's some issues we're working through with the you know, right side drive and trying to get it uh, to where we can test it in the field. And we have the future infrastructure in place because eventually we expect the next generation of fleet to be electric. Uh, it's five to 10 years away, just for a reality check there. I mean, to get all the, um, the power and, and everything you need to collect garbage uh, in a truck is more than just, you know, a, uh, you know like, like a hybrid type vehicle. It's a, it's a big deal. So we got to test it out, but we are uh, working on that. Um, our new collection vehicles uh, are equipped with onboard scales. So as our truck drives around, it goes right up to the legal limit before it goes to the, the facility. Uh, that reduces our vehicle miles traveled as well and makes us more efficient. Uh, on top, I've got there that we've converted 85% of our fleet to C and G and ordered the electric side, ordering the electric side loader. Um, we have GPS monitoring on all our trucks, which uh, increases safety and efficiency and complies with DOT regs. Uh, we've added a commercial compliance office. We had a regional solid waste authority that used to regulate garbage hauling for the entire commercial districts of Sac County and Sac City. That is now uh, disbanded. So we had to stand up our own office. It came with funding and a revenue source, which was good. Um, but it's, um, and part of that funding actually uh, on the bottom there, you see it's allocated to enhance so, uh, services, quality of life stuff, tackling ongoing illegal dumping in our community, and a lot of the, um, you know, the issues we deal with the unhoused and trying to clean up our corridors and, and stuff like that. So that a lot of that is funded out of that program. So here's a little bit about our processing of organics, green waste, and food waste into compost. Um, it's significant progress towards our climate action plan, and it reduces uh, GHG emissions. I've got some data on that I'll present in a moment. Food waste recycling, Cities will, uh, city residents will be able to recycle food waste and food soiled paper organics into their current green waste container beginning July, 2022. Uh, our tenant household junk pickup, um, we're offering two household junk pickups appointments per year. We've done that and we've expanded that to include tenants. It does, you don't have to be the owner necessarily of the parcel. That was an older rule that we needed to get away from that was uh, sort of 
uh, inhibiting access to our services and we think has a nexus with illegal dumping. And so tenants now can call in and make an appointment for a neighborhood cleanup. Um, that starts again in February. We don't do that while we're doing leaf season, which is going on right now. We're collecting the leaves out of the street from November to February. So. Uh, we're going to maintain four week street sweeping cycle um, implementing in 2022 and we actually sweep during leaf season the bike lane the dedicated bike lanes downtown weekly so every Friday we're doing all the new as we we, we develop these separated bike lanes like 12th street 19th uh, J street has a long stretch uh, we separate the, we sweep those weekly on Fridays too right before the weekend uh, every week during the uh, during leaf season because they get impacted from leaf, from uh, leaf pickup. And then we go back to monthly in February street sweeping, but we try to do the bike lanes a second time. So we're gonna have a four week street sweeping schedule uh, starting next year. And all those augmented uh, uh, separate uh, street sweeping we do for the, for the bike lanes. Um, curbside oil, uh, still uh, part of our program. Uh, part of the rate adjustment is to balance our solid waste fund uh, from the pandemic and the stay at home order. I presented some of that data and the long term replenishment of our reserve fund to a 90 day safety net. It, it's starting to go down underneath 90 days and, and, and uh, best practices to have a 90 day reserve for like a natural disaster or something like a pandemic or uh, more often like a flood or a natural disaster that compromises our ability to perform city services or skyrockets the amount of garbage we're collecting because we're clearing the streets and or we have homes that get damaged and stuff like that. So that's where that little padding uh, is built for. So part of our rate adjustment is to get that back up to 90 days. 1383 implementation. So, so to, to, to um, support 1383 implementation, um, the food, race, food waste recycling, supplies will be available to customers throughout the city. Um, customers can make an appointment uh, online, we have not yet, but in probably spring uh, of 2022, maybe closer to April or May, we'll be rolling out a program where you'll be able to sign up online and get one of these kitchen countertop, kitchen countertop container. Uh, it's two gallons, a uh, convenient way to store your, you know, eggshells and uh, coffee grounds and your food waste. Uh, we're going to give uh, a box of these compostable bags as well to give people the experience of whether, you know, we're not going to provide them forever, but we'll give the first box and people can decide whether they need that in the long term and, and pick them up, um, you know, at the store. They're, they're starting to sell those everywhere. Those compostable bags uh, make it a little cleaner when you're cleaning out the food waste container and dumping it into the uh, container on the street um, that you bring to the street. So here's a little greenhouse gas reduction data from the new program. So we've got a land application, our baseline, which is what we use, which is our current method, which is land application, and then landfilling of the food waste, which is what happens to a lot of the food waste. A lot of it also goes down the grinder, but we're anticipating we're capturing 15,000 tons. So on the right, you'll see what organic implementations that are compost uh, and the emissions, the annual emission change of 21,000 minus 21,000 metric tons. Um, and then as, as well on the food waste, we go from uh, landfilling and generating 5850 to a negative 4,500. So our net is around 30,000 metric tons of greenhouse gases per year from the new program. So here's a rate adjustment going to council in late January. Our date is January 25th. We're proposing to increase the overall rates for monthly garbage by a total of $11.49 over three years. That's the table on top. It's $3.83 three times, April 1st of 2022, then January 1st, 2023. Up in the left, you'll see the implementation dates. That's when the, when the customers see their bill go up. The proposed rates that we have on the uh, in the middle table there is our we used our 64 gallon container. Your rate can be a little lower if you generate less garbage and have a 38 or more if you have a 95. And that's our rate for the 64 there. 42.59 goes up to 46.42, 50.25, and then ultimately 54.08. On the bottom there is our food waste only container. We have a, about 12,000 of our 125 
I'm sorry, more, we got 135,000 accounts, uh, 12,000 that don't, they're green waste exempt at the moment. They either have an HOA that takes all their landscaping or they have um, no yard, zero scaping. They're in an immature uh, development with no, uh, with no trees. Um, they, they were eventually gonna be phased out over time, some of them, but now they're, they're all coming into the program because they're gonna get a food waste only container. So that rate on the bottom, it shows zero initially because right now those, are, those customers are exempt. They'll get a, uh, we're gonna give them a tall, thin, like 35 gallon-ish container um, that uh, they'll be able to use, uh, I think it's 32 actually, and um, we, wheel to the street and they get a slightly lower rate, but eventually those rates start to catch up with the green waste rate of the normal customers. So uh, the overall adjustments by percentage here, you see 9%, eight, uh, you know, 8.99, 8.25, total of the 26.98% adjustment. As I demonstrated with the processing fees alone, our increase of $6 million is almost 10% of our enterprise fund. So of that 27% there, 26.98%, well over half, two thirds roughly, of this in increase in adjustment is from the 1383, the food waste recycling and the greenhouse gas emission, you know, climate change part of that program. So the other third of it is just inflation. We're all experiencing that and that runs the cost up of driving a garbage truck and collecting everything and, and, uh, and our reserve and uh, some of the pandemic costs. But two thirds of it is the actual program. Um, a lot of that's the processing fee. A lot of that's some trucks. And then there's a bunch of containers we're buying. And then there's promoting the program and education. And uh, we rerouted to accommodate the new program basically as well. So this on the bottom shows our, our reserve fund and where we, uh, where we end up after the rate adjustment, which is healthy, which is a 90 day reserve. We end up with 91 because we fall, we fall below, but then we get back up with the rate adjustment to in fiscal year 2025, and we have that prudent 90-day reserve. The regional rate comparison uh, is a slightly different to this number because we, to, to make it apples and apples, we pulled out street sweeping um, uh, because some, a lot of jurisdictions have that in their streets division. In the city, we have it in our recycling solid waste, so it's built into that bill. So some of the other jurisdictions that, that don't have that <clears throat> the, for the same menu of services, we have our current rate and then our proposed rate. And then you can see where we stand relative to Davis and Napa, and then some of the East Bay, Berkeley, San Jose, and Oakland, and uh, Sac County. Uh, this needs to be adjusted. They just went up $5. So they're actually at 38 And there go, they've approved $8, excuse me, $8 more over the next four years, $2 increases. So they'll catch up to us basically. Uh, or be slightly lower at the end, but but uh, a, a slightly larger increase overall. Um, so this is a little bit about our utility rate assistance program. We have approximately 8,500 8, participants. This is a way if you qualify due to low income, you can apply and get a reduction uh, on your utility bill. You have to uh, renew every two years with the city or SMUD. I think the programs are linked. I, never done it, I don't know how it exactly works, uh, but the data is, is basically exchanged with SMUD to identify the eligible residents. Uh, they get a discount across their water, wastewater, recycling, solid waste services. It's run through our Department of Utilities, so I, I, I don't have as much experience and they're not here tonight, but it's available and uh, you can just look it up using that acronym and City of Sacramento. And, and if you qualify, you would get great assistance on the increase. So it's a little bit of the outreach that um, uh, Jess has been doing a tremendous job developing all this stuff. Um, we have, um, we've done cu customer outreach in the last few months. Um, mailers for our rate adjustment were sent to nearly 140,000 accounts. Uh, I think it was about 138 actually, I said 135. Um, I, I never have an exact number, but it's a lot. We have a lot. those are households too, and that makes sense when you have a half city of a half million people, you know, two to three people per household, roughly average, right? So uh, they printed it online, and and uh, instructions were uh, in English, Spanish, Chinese, Russian, and Vietnamese. 
um, with an informational flyer provided with a Spanish translation posted to the website. And then on the Prop 18 card, you can call any of those languages allow you to call into our 311 where we have a contract with Language World and they're the, like the premier interpreting um, uh, group in town and we have them under contract to interpret. So if you're Chinese or Russian or Vietnamese, you can call in, they'll get someone on the line and they'll speak the language and explain to you what all this means. Um, so the city web pages updates um, contains translation functions for any information. 311 is where is Language World. I mentioned them, they provide the on-call interpretive services. And we do social media posts on the rate adjustments. Um, and the hearings were posted to our Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram accounts. Um, we have, we'll have a dedicated web page, or we have one for organics. Uh, community meetings, we offered all uh, neighborhood associations community meetings, more than 90 uh, neighborhood associations. And I think we're closer to 30. We've had at least 25. Uh, I've got a list I'll show you in a moment. And again, this, uh, more about the information being accessible in native language through our interpretive services. Here is the uh, presentations of all the neighborhood associations and the dates. Uh, we did had multiple some nights where Jesso is doing one, I'm doing another, and, and uh, we got through all those. Uh, um, I think we have one more coming up, actually. Um, so here's just some impacts if the solid waste rate is not approved. We'll fall below our 90-day reserve in this fiscal year, and we'll actually be insolvent by 2025. We'd face regulatory penalties if we fail to comply with 1383. Uh, our refuse vehicles will not be replaced on schedule, so maintenance costs go up, service day interruptions, overtime increases, and future rate adjustments just end up being larger because you're deferring what you need to pay for now and you have to pay for it then more later because you fall further behind. So this is a little bit of our schedule. Um, We've been through our utility rate advisory commission, and then we mailed the adjustment to customers in, uh, in October. Uh, in January, we actually have the date we're going to council and it's January 25th. Um, we actually also have a number of uh, organizations like yours uh, providing letters of support for the, for, the, for the actual adjustment because it pertains to the climate action plan and the program. And that includes Californians Against Waste. That includes the Sacramento Environmental Commission. It includes the National Action Stewardship Council. And uh, we'd love it if your uh, organization was willing to either participate in the council meeting. I know you were at the climate action one that was recent uh, where Jennifer Venema presented. Um, or write a letter. Uh, we, we'd, we'd help you. We have, you know, tons of these letters that have been written for us already, and we're going to be, you wouldn't be alone. We've got uh, multiple, and at some point we can even, you know, if we get a sidebar communication and you are interested in doing that, we can share with you what some of the other uh, environmental organizations are supporting so that we, uh, so that you know you're not alone, you know, that you're not the only one putting the letter of support for the program. So, uh, that's it. Uh, I'll take any questions. Um, Margaret and Jess are here, uh, experts as well on the program, and um, happy to talk about this or other stuff related to recycling solid waste. I'll stop sharing. If you want me to pull anything up, I could pull it back up. Fine. Perfect. No, John, thank you so much. That was a fabulous overview. And it's honestly, yeah, a lot more than actually just rolling out food. <laughs> food service collection, it looks like there's a lot it, um, in the things that the city is doing. So I'm happy to open it up. If folks have questions, probably the easiest way would be in the chat or let us know if you want to be unmuted. I do have a couple of questions we've already taken from folks or a couple of my from myself that we can get to, but um, I'll give it a moment for folks if you have anything and you want to add it to the chat. We'll We'll give a moment for that, but just want to also say we really appreciate the time that John, Margaret, and Joseph have spent to talk to us at 7 p.m. on a Wednesday. So uh, thank you so much, as I'm sure you're doing this a lot, it seems like, from that long list of me. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having us again. Sure. I'm mean, actually... While we wait for someone to come in, I will ask, oh, I'm sorry, Muriel has her hand up. So Muriel, if you want to, I believe you have the ability to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Actually, I have a lot of questions. 
Um, so I actually um, compost all of my food waste. So I don't really need this. Um, but now I understand that the city is um, constrained both by Prop 218 and also just by the structure of the program. But thinking about the long-term future, um, how can the program evolve to motivate um, residents, homeowners, to really cut back um, and radically change um, the system? Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, I do, and and it um, and that's wonderful that you uh, compost at home. I um, there's a couple of things that uh, do you have a green waste can already? Oh yeah, I've got so, the three. Yeah, so uh, yeah, it, you know, I I, will, I compost almost all of my green waste too. I only give you guys like the Bermuda grass and stuff like that. Sure, or the large branches or large twigs. Right, I mean, there's right. there's a lot of things that don't go in. A backyard composting bin ideally and I, I get that there's a lot of people who are vegan don't have you know steak bones you don't want to put that kind of stuff in there or meat bones um, you also the, the the 1383 is all organics so that includes food soil paper like a pizza box or a uh, things that you would not put in your backyard composting bin and well, then I'll, I'll, I'll tell you <laughs> I put stuff in there that I'm not they say I'm not supposed to but it's okay Sure. And, and it's just, it's a little, you know, and, and you're doing the least expensive thing and the best thing that you can do for the greater good of the region. And it, uh, you, I don't, you'd have to turn the pitchfork. I, I uh, did a lot more backyard composting. Uh, I don't now, uh, cause I have the can and, but most people, most customers already have the green waste can. So you're already paying for that. I mean, that's the rate we do. Um, you know, the, the we accept a lot more in this program than you than you can typically do in your backyard. But we also support, um, you know, uh, a number of different organizations that we that we work with. We do our backyard composting uh, with the um, the master gardeners. Uh, that program was delayed during or actually on hold because of the pandemic. But that will be back, and we we continue to encourage that. We're still going to roll out this program, and of the twelve thousand customers that get the food waste, can a lot of them will say the same thing, and they won't have the green waste because they have whatever. And it's going to have to be the same answer, which is there's a lot more that we accept in our program that you can't do in your backyard. And then we plan to eventually develop an exemption program, but. And, uh, you know, the state Cal Recycle, well, I don't think Kate can talk about that because she's not wearing that hat tonight, but they um, we're, we're basically um, looking at an exemption program that uh, will have very strict requirements. You're going to have to pay for an application and we won't be able to just rubber stamp exemptions. We're going to have to do either a site visit or ask for photos or upload to demonstrate um, because quite honestly, if we if if we are really liberal about the exemptions and we give them out, it becomes a bit of a problem because everyone's yeah, I know. To, people are going to try and game the system. So everyone's going to want an exemption, and um, whatever we say to them about you know they're going to you know, well I, you know I don't eat that or I don't I don't generate that and. Right. And so, so we will have a program eventually that allows exemptions, but it's not going to be. It's going to be. Not to climb all over. Alex, oh, okay, she muted herself. Um, it's go, it's so, going so, to, it's, so, but um, I mean, I, so you're looking at the future, and and you're seeing the same um, conundrums that I'm seeing. But I also wanted to put a bug in your ear about the rates for uh, making the rates more proportional for the garbage can because it was and i was informed that the city can't do more than they're doing now but san jose is doing more than they're doing now and their city attorney must have said it's okay so please talk to san jose and try and push that envelope you see what i'm saying uh i i, I you mentioned the garbage rate we do have a variable can rate so if you yeah, have but the see, it's not it's not proportional because you're charging a flat rate plus you know, a surcharge, 
based on the size of the can. So it's not proportional to the size of the can. Well, right. Yeah, yeah. No, it wouldn't. It's not commensurate with the exact size of the can. You're right. But no, it San Jose but because is they're different. because they're the, the, we have within our enterprise fund, we have sub funds for each of the commodities. We're not allowed really to uh, we're, we're not supposed to. And it ends up happening when 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 that's why we come forward with rate adjustments, which is uh, one, the garbage is funding recycling or recycling is funding green waste or green, waste, you know, et cetera. So uh, the the variable can rate is just on the garbage and it's commensurate roughly to within that sub silo, if you will, of garbage rates. So, but San Jose was also on the graphic I showed as one of the examples I bring forward to try to get this rate adjustment because their monthly garbage rates are almost twice as ours. So that there is a limit to what the council is going to want to approve. And you know, we're going to, I'm going to find a lot about that personally when I go forward with this rate right. adjustment. Uh, no, having a more proportional motivates people to cut back. Also wanted mm. to put a bug in your ear about the um, composting um, container. So years ago, I went to a city workshop and they gave me one of those flat things with holes in it, a black plastic thing, and you, you make it into a cylinder and they stopped doing that. Those are great. Please bring them back. Okay. I know what you're talking about, those ones for your backyard, Muriel. Those are, those are, yeah, those are cool. Yeah, so they, they started to replace them with these dinky little things. Um, oh, I managed yeah, that, to, oh, to glue them onto an extra one, so now I got three, but then they fell apart, so I managed to put them back together with big zip ties. Yeah, the cheap <laughs> ones were the green, kind of Swiss cheesy looking ones, and the well, bias. Mine are black. Sure, black, but they're but they're, you're right. They're a little more flimsy. Well, we're giving one free. We don't. We can't really afford to give out like the bio stack or the Toro, the nice ones, you know. So, it, but avid composters like yourself, I, I had a Toro and a bio stack um, when I used to do it a lot more, and still at my other house. But um, so anyway, that's that's uh, those are the those are the premier ones, the better, uh, definitely better compost bins. Um, Muriel, if you don't mind. Thank you for those. And if you have some more questions, we are gonna skip. I know Oscar has his hand up and then a couple more questions. And if you have some more, we'll come back to you. I hope that's okay. So I wanted to turn it over to Oscar now. Oscar, I know you had your hand raised. Go for it. Thanks, Kate. Uh, am I unmuted now? Thank yes, you. you're unmuted. Right. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, I probably missed this because I had a little problem log logging on, uh, but are the, facilities, the receiving facilities that you showed on uh, on your map, uh, are those where the processing of the uh, organics will take place? Or uh, those just transfer stations? Sure. So the, actually, I, I, the one map I had up might have, uh, I should have pointed a little bit closer to was, was when I was talking about the kitchen countertop containers. And it was of our about eight different community centers that were working on a, a deal to uh, distribute these food waste containers. I should have said that actually to our community to our community centers. So when you sign up online, you'll get a you know you can go to Bell Coolidge or right. But that's not what I'm asking. Sure, about. I know I'm gonna, but I wanted to clarify because that was the map. The three facilities that we delivered to, um, uh, one is in South Sacramento, Republic Services. It's on Elder Creek Road near Florin Perkins. That's that facility receives about sixty percent of our tonnage. Um, most of the city is south of the river. Uh, the North Area Recovery Station on Roseville Road and Watt receives about 20% of our tonnage. And about 15, 20% of our tonnage as well goes over the causeway and direct to YOLO, which has an actual composting operations. The North and South ones I mentioned are transfer operations and they go to compost facilities. The South one goes towards the Stockton area, um, Forward Inc., Scotts, there's multiple compost facilities down there. And the north one goes up to Recology, Feather River Organics from the NARS, the, the, the Roseville Watt uh, facility. YOLO actually has a, a real great operation right there. So when we get it there, that's actually our cheapest disposal option because it's in the 73 range because it's not transferred, it's composted right there at the YOLO landfill. So those are the three, three facilities we're going to. Right, and I assume that YOLO can't take all the city's compost and that's why um, the others are 
it, it's a it's an off route and it's a proximity thing. So our actual city garbage trucks contain about eight tons, and you don't you don't really long haul that much. You long haul in a transfer trailer, which holds about twenty four. But actually, some of what goes to the south area, that Elder Creek transfer station. They, they, they're, they're, they're like a broker, a marketer. So they'll send stuff to YOLO. So some of our stuff might go to YOLO, but it doesn't make sense. Once you get kind of past 99 or everything in the South land park, there's sort of a, a point where we routed it on our maps where it made more sense to go to the transfer station. So as opposed to direct to YOLO. So we manage that, you know, dollar wise, basically kind of. I see. Thank you. Thanks, Oscar. So John and team, I have a couple comments from the chat and some of these were just comments and some are questions. So I wanted to read those out. So Alex said, if processing food waste is biggest cost, support neighborhood composters and eliminate waste at the lowest level could come down to providing easily transported composting bins and informing citizens of local options. And, and that's kind of goes to one of the questions I asked you. I would love to talk more about like in the future, what do you see if we want to expand local composting? So that's a great question. But um, a direct question Megan asked was, what will be done with the finished compost, which it did look like Jessa, thank you so much, replied to in the chat. I didn't know if you wanted to chat a little bit more about that um, to the group or address. Um, nothing other than an interesting phenomenon that compost seems to have more value a little bit the further it gets away from the valley, even though we, rice is our largest uh, crop in the, within the, you know, 20, 30 mile range. And it, um, it's not very compost, compost reliant, as opposed to you get to Napa, then you get to, and you get really high value for it when you get it all the way down to the East Bay or areas like Los Gatos or where there's, you know, artichokes or Los Panos or, you know, uh, places like that. So, and, 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 and those trucks that are, if they end up driving material there, it's semi-processed. So it's already starting to break down. No garbage is going by then it's been picked and clean and it might go to a compost windrow composting operation or it might go first to Stockton and then be made into finished compost, then go to a, agriculture, but those 18 wheelers just disconnect and they're hauling back, um, you know, those are the ports. So anything that we buy from overseas that has to come inland, though it's a backhaul, so it's not inefficient. So that's good, but, but, but our broker handles all that. And we get a, we can get a report at the end of where everything went. And, and a significant volume and weight reduction as well. What, what is 85,000 tons when it comes out of the truck ends up being, 40,000, 50,000 tons in terms of final weight of the compost. Yeah, interesting. No, thank you for addressing that. Um, another question from Alex was, any thoughts on animal-based compost systems, like pigs and chickens eating food waste over, he said, uh, she said machinery factory-based systems. I think that's more industrial composting scale. So do you have any thoughts about that? So, uh, so we... Um... Man, I, I, I don't know if it's still turning, uh, still accepting food waste, but there was a hog farm, uh, Smitty's Hog Farm. I, I'd been there. It was out in the Amador County where a lot of food waste in the initial uh, program was going, uh, but neighbors were pretty up in arms. I went there and it was, you know, it was, there was a lot of odors. And uh, so the digestion facilities are where a lot of that stuff goes to. But um you know, um, any, any, a lot of commercial facilities do that on the, you know, on their own. There's, there's, um, I mean, we do all sorts of stuff. We, we, we have properties out at our Sutter's Landing at our landfill that are, uh, that are hummocky. They can't be mowed with a, a tractor that we have goats that actually do our, our fire, um, you know, mitigation out at Sutter's Landing, for example. So where, where we can do it, we can. Uh, the hog farm was great when it, uh, I don't know if it's still, operating. So that's a little bit background on that. I, I look into it and get back to you. I know odors is a big thing sometimes also with encroaching suburbs that becomes yeah. very problematic. That's for folks here in my day job, we there's rendering, which is usually where animal carcasses, which we don't like to think about go, um, but they are usually encro encroached on by suburbs. So people complain about the smells of these facilities that 
generally rendered animal carcasses. It's always very interesting. So, okay. Another question. <laughs> so what are, I, I'm not sure you addressed this, so apologies. What are the plans for the compost product from the city's new composting programs? And uh, a second question that, can you sell compost to offset costs? Um, so the compost is sold by our processors and that is factored into the processing. So that rate we pay to process the material includes all the profits they get on the back end to, for composting it, uh, you know, for selling the compost. And so, and again, sometimes they have to go a little further to get more value for the material. That's all built into the, into the processing. So there's no windfall at the end for us. Um, we are considering compost giveaways again and bringing back that program. Uh, I imagine that might either be in the question or someone will ask it, but we just, right now we have to focus on the implementation through July, 2022. And we're looking at 2023, possibly as depending on how our marketing goes and how we have to meet the purchasing requirements of 1383 and giving some back to the community and possibly three locations like in the north at uh, North Area Corporation Yard or in, the, in at Sutter's Landing or maybe at Meadowview or Meadowview Yard where we do a couple days in April on the Saturdays where we give away compost. But we still have to put all that together. We haven't, um, we're, we're basically, uh, all hands on deck to get the collection program up and running. All right, great. Um, there are a few more comments and not questions, but about, you know, the price of, in the chat about the price of fossil-based fuel fertilizer and if it's expensive and continues to go up. So hopefully compost might start to increase in value um, and that someone's chicken composting site receives food waste but collecting arborist waste is critical for managing odors and composting. So yeah, that um, chipped waste, I would assume. Um, I had a question for you. In the long term, or you know, thinking of us as the activist community who is loves the idea of local, and obviously you can see from some of the comments that people are like, can things that we do in our backyard, and obviously keeping it as close as possible reduces vehicle miles traveled for some of this material. Um, do you see a increasing role for that in the long term, or like what can folks do to maybe like push on that? Or is the city thinking of a more local, neighborhood level, regional level, maybe regions too big level programs for local composting? Maybe you've heard of it. There's a few local businesses I know of, like like Oak Park Soil or like Resoil Sack that try mm -hmm. to do local collection. Like, do, what's the place you see for that in the long term mm -hmm. um, for us to push on as a way to divert some of that waste even closer to home? Or is that yeah. useful to you? Well, it, 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 it helps the general cause because it reduces our impact uh, on our collection, allows us to be more efficient. I mean, one thing we do, we ask residents to do along those lines is to use their container as much as they can for green waste and not use the street, but people are used to dumping stuff in the street. But the more they can put in the container, the better off we are. So the more of that happens, the, the, the better. Unfortunately, I don't think it'll ever get to a level where it can preclude us from having to collect in the city of trees. You know, we, we generate so much green waste. And uh, this is my first year as general manager. And the, the uh, I worked for the county for a long time in the same, same solid waste. And uh, even in the city because of the maturity of our tree canopy and some of what happens when it rains like in land park and just every leaf seems to weigh weigh you know half a pound i mean it just it we get really big weights and there's no other way to gather that which is up in the street and get it to a you know smaller composting operation like you're talking about all that has to be done on a pro higher processing level um, I'll say that I looked up, I was multitasking and I looked up Smitty's Hog Ranch and I put a little link to it in the, uh, in the um, chat. So uh, I think they're still around. It's in Lodi, near Lodi, north of Lodi. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, someone put in the, and, and, and that's a very good point. It's when we think of just food waste and composting and some of our green waste, there's such a huge amount of green waste that curbside collection will always be a thing. So then if you already have curbside collection for everyone, there is an inherent cost. You can't, it's not gonna ever go away. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, Alex put in the chat, Oak Park soil and resoil collect from residents and businesses and their food waste comes to our chicken powered composting site in Oak Park. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> cool local actions, yeah. Um, 
Okay, I think that was it for uh, Oscar. I see you popping up. Do you have any more questions? Or if anyone had any more questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the City of SAC team. Wait a second. Muriel, go for it. So um, my parents actually retired to Oregon. And it turns out that in Oregon, um, garbage collection and all of that is private. So um, you actually can choose to not get that service. It was pretty interesting. And my parents um, were, you know, pretty uh, traditional. And so they um, managed to do everything without um, using the garbage service. Yeah, I've, I've seen. Uh... Uh, so, so it would be really interesting to explore the economics of those vendors. Um, yeah, I uh, we've got I, I've seen a lot of stuff in a lot of places that you know I've seen residents sharing uh, sharing garbage containers to get out of it, basically doing the same doing you know I mean I'm not saying that that's you obviously have something where uh, everything's getting recycled, so they were able to. I'm not sure how rural or or whatever, but the same, all the same exists in terms of if we roll out anything like that, it's going to involve a verification program because we can't just rubber stamp those kinds of exemptions. So, okay. any last questions for John and the team? Thanks for this presentation. Thank you all. Is there any interest in being at council on January 25th or writing a, writing a, a, a nice letter? No. <laughs> John, we can, of course, always take that back to our board. And for anyone here who's interested, yeah, so I'll make sure I at least post, I well, at the very least, we'll be posting that that is coming to council on that date. So for folks who are interested in sure. making comments or calling in, have that opportunity and know when it's happening. So like we... Oh yeah, and, uh, and it looks like some some contact information was shared in the chat. So I I will definitely take that back to our to our board um, of interest. It was great to know that that other organizations were doing that. And yeah, for anyone here, feel free. Always encourage. I I again, not my cow recycle hat, but food waste collection and composting is very important. And though it's all the kinks are not quite worked out, and the state has put down quite a mandate <laughs> with the you know the infrastructure not completely here, and always local composting. It's a it's a really important for reducing our uh, emissions from landfills in the long term, especially like methane. So, of course, I even home compost. It's fabulous, and so but I'm very excited for all those things like my eggshells that I really shouldn't be putting in the thing in my backyard right now. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so, okay, I'll turn over Muriel. It looks like she has a question. So John, are, John, are you expecting a lot of pushback at council um, from like just average people? I mean, you've been out uh, really selling this thing. What kind of uh, response have you gotten? Are you expecting a lot of pushback? Um, you know, most of the neighborhood associations tend to be people who are civic minded, involved, and they're not necessarily it's, it is more of our, um, you know, uh, people that aren't necessarily going to oppose it, but we did have our public hearing already. So the city council has a utility rate advisory committee that actually handles this kind of matter in the public hearing setting. And we had at least four or five people that showed up and didn't want the increase. And, and we expect there to be a fair amount um, that might even show up at council and other issues, but um generally you know people don't want to vote for councilmen don't want to vote for um rate increases i mean it's not a good time it's a pandemic and there's economy issues and so that that may be where you know the um you know the the the, the possible you know the council members not wanting to vote comes from is their a their desire to not raise rates on their constituents i mean it's not popular so that's where the climate action plan nexus and all that stuff comes into play because a lot of this stuff, again, is Gates talks is a state mandate. If you don't do it, you end up in compliance, which is not a good place to go because I, before I was general manager, I was planning superintendent, I managed that old landfill at Sutter's Landing and we had a cleanup and abatement order 
with the water board, which is like going into the penalty box and you almost never get out. You spend a ton of money and none of it's on really, I mean, it's not all to waste, but it doesn't, it's not like the trucks and the containers where we're, we're actually making progress and capturing food waste and reducing climate action. Now we're tardy or late on the program and we've got to hire consultants to come up with plans to demonstrate to this, the, the, the state how we're gonna eventually do what we should have done last year you know, and that's kind of what, that's what we don't want to be. So that's why we really need the council. And I'll make a similar presentation as this. I'm going to try to make it unambiguously clear and compelling that this is part of your climate action plan. This is part of your, mm -hmm. this is part of, uh, you know, greenhouse gas emissions. And I, I'm hopeful, yeah. I'm hopeful, but, Ed, but support of CAW, I mean, I maybe I'll, you know, make an email with Kate or, or someone else, but anyone, but we can send you when we get these other letters so you see what they're doing. And you don't have no pressure on that. It's more I'm more joking around if you want to show up at the council and support us on an, on what might be unpopular with a lot of people. But we also know that a lot of people are very supportive and excited about the program. So it's there's all all types out there. And when you have a half million residents, that's basically what you're gonna get. So Yeah, we're saying you could have seen this presentation and want to complain at the council meeting. So if that's what you want to do, go for it. No, I'm kidding. Um, Muriel, is your hand still up? Or did you yeah, one, one more question. So the street sweeping. Um, yeah, those bike lanes really need it, but there's a whole lot of places. I'm really not sure that the street sweeping really makes a difference. We don't. It, it, the only spot in the city where we have street sweeping coordinated with parking is the downtown area. The rest of the city, we street sweep, but we don't have a coordinated, you know, parking um, issue in terms of, um, you know, uh, so so it, so we don't we we drive around the park cars basically. In San Francisco, it's a totally another thing. The street <laughs> the street sweepers and the parking division in San Francisco, they might as well be in the same office together. It's total. It's inexorably linked at the hip, and the 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 the, the they ticket to get the street sweeping out of the way. But it's San Fran, you know. We call it street sweeping because that's a little bit more, um, you know, flashy to say than what it actually is, which is gutter sweeping. We sweep to keep the gutters draining and the water getting to the drainage ditches. If the bike lane somehow gets swept at the same time. That is great, and we love that. Now, because of new, you know, um, green, you know, uh, climate action and 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 transit oriented development, we are diversifying our street sweeping. We got a, we're buying a more narrow seven footer to so to, to for some other real um, things. So we end up basically just like I mentioned today, and we actually had this issue with Saba, and I was emailing them uh about the downtown and how we do it do the dedicated bike lanes every friday so we've so it's no longer really is gutter sweeping it's becoming you know bike lanes and everything and that's so it, it's a progress over time as we diversify i the the effort to go to san francisco across the city of sacramento would be herculean and probably not something that the cost of that would be um, kind of difficult um, to um, uh, for the city council to swallow, but it hasn't been looked at yet, which is how we would have to, we'd have to literally parking, put parking signs up all over the city and change the entire, and then link our street sweeping um, program and schedule to that. And, it, and in San Francisco, we've got seven street sweepers, two thin ones, you know, one eight footer, one seven, we're buying a seven. So maybe not eight or nine streets, was there like 75 street sweepers in the city of San Francisco? And then you saw their rates. I think they were in it. Their rates are. Oh, right. I, so, so you're saying though that that street sweeping is really necessary, but those things weigh a ton. Now that, that makes a lot of diesel to move those guys around. Yeah. You, you could hire the homeless to sweep the, the bike lanes on J street. So 50 years ago, when I was in France, I saw street sweepers with brooms in Paris. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm not, a, I'm on mute. So just saying that, that um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of options to think about. 
perfect for a public comment at the council meeting on something that you want the city to look into in the future. That's always what I say, but no, great points, Muriel. Thank you for bringing all those up. So um, I wanna be cognizant of time. It's 8.02. Thanks to everyone who joined us tonight. I appreciate the great questions. And thanks so much to John, Margaret, and Jessa for joining us at this very late hour on a Wednesday. So we really appreciate it. And yeah, happy to follow up with you, John and team. Um, and I'll bring this up to the board, see if they're interested in writing a letter of support and kind of give them the overview from this presentation. So, but I just want to say, I really appreciate your time in the presentation, so. Yeah, and I'd say that I saw a couple more in the chat. One is that uh, oh. the combined sewer thing, yes, we, uh, but only parts of the city, a lot of the city isn't, but uh, there's a map somewhere that, that I've seen that talks about like Tahoe Park, my house in Tahoe Park is a combined sanitary, anyway. So uh, vacuum lead truck picking up leaves. That's what our sweet sweepers kind of do that. They have a, they throw it in the middle and they vac it, but it's not a vacuum truck, but it somewhat does that. Anyway, there you go. Yeah. Try to keep up. So we'll say thank everyone. You all. Oh yeah, thank, thank you, you all. Thank you. thank you the team. And, and now anyone who wants to maybe adopt John's cat can stay on yeah. and everyone else can leave. <laughs> so, yeah. Just well, email me, I'm gonna you go. show it again, you. John. Yeah. Uh, he's around, <laughs> he's not here right now. Cats, right. Ne they never cooperate, so um, <laughs> even if they, difficult. yeah. Thank well, you, thank, Kate. Thank you again. Email yeah, no, thank me. you so much. Email me, seriously, if you want a kitten or a cat, I do, <laughs> I do rescue, so email me. I'll, I'll get you set up. Thank you for rescuing, for doing rescue work. I, 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 I did I, it for many, many years, and I'm yep. grateful to anyone who does it. Thank you, Karen. It's nice to see you. It's nice to see you too, John. It's nice to know that you're a rescuer. <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, just happened, you know, you find your calling, I guess. <laughs> yeah, or they find you. That's right, they do. Thank you both. Uh, thank you all. And uh, Hello, everyone. present to you anytime. Thanks, John. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.